Good evening, everyone. Wherever you are, whether in the comfort of your home or at your workplaces, I hope all of you are having a meaningful and fruitful SC by SC conference thus far. Or if you're just tuning in now, hello and welcome to the conference. I am Chris from the Securities Commission, and I will be the moderator for this next session. And in the next 30 minutes, we will be discussing the topic microfinancing, uh, breaking socioeconomic barriers. And before I introduce my distinguished panelists, I would like to remind everyone that you can use Slido to interact with us in the session. To participate, all you need to do is click on the microfinancing breaking socioeconomic barriers button on the Slido panel on the right side of your screen. Uh, and you can then ask your questions, vote for other questions, and even share your ideas. And we are looking forward to some of your questions on Slido, and I will attempt to integrate some of the more pertinent questions within today's discussion. Uh, now that's out of the way, I would like to introduce my distinguished panelists for today. With me, I have Tunku Denny, the founder and CEO of MicroLeap. MicroLeap is a peer-to-peer -peer financing platform registered with the Securities Commission Malaysia uh, with a focus on microfinancing. Previously, Tunku Denny has 15 years of financial services experience in diverse fields, including asset liability management and money market sales. And also with me, I have Catherine Lee joining us from the US, who is the co-founder of Butterfly FX, a social enterprise dedicated to improving financial literacy in underserved communities. She has partnered with organizations from fintech companies and family-run conglomerates to flexible working platforms to promote better financial understanding and inclusion. Tunku Denny and Catherine, it's a privilege to have you with us today. Super excited. <laughs> Microfinancing, uh, a fundraising mechanism that has promised to lift many out of poverty and help empower those in the margins of society. Small amounts of financing provided by investors to micro small entrepreneurs who lack access to conventional sources of finance, such as bank loans or venture capital due to various factors. And in the spirit of financial inclusion, the hope is that these enterprises then go on to grow and flourish and contribute to the local economy. So before we get into the details, I would like for us to take a step back and take a wider lens. Tunku Denny, I would like to direct this first question to you. Uh, and for the benefit of those hearing this term for the first time, what exactly is microfinancing? And in an ideal world, what does a tool like this aim to accomplish? And, and more specifically to MicroLeap, how does MicroLeap play a part in this space? Yeah, thanks, Christopher. So microfinancing is basically uh, small loans to micro enterprises or micro businesses that may not have access to uh, loans from traditional financial institutions like banks. Uh, the reason is banks prefer to lend more larger ticket sizes, uh, which are more profitable uh, because of the costs uh, of just you know, um, running a bank. Uh, they have lots of branches they have to pay, lots of staff, so it's, um, it's not that um, cheap for them to lend small amounts. And when I talk about small amounts, it could be in the region of 1,000 ringgit up to 50,000 ringgit financing. So those are the types of microfinancing that, 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 that we are talking about. Now, the, the whole role of microfinance uh, and what microfinance institutions, um, in Malaysia, you have Amna Iktia Malaysia, which is the largest microfinance institution in, in, uh, in the country. So they provide small loans to small businesses. Um, you know, this could be a pisang goreng seller on the side of the street, you know, all the way up to slightly um, larger micro enterprises that, 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 that need financing up to 50,000 ringgit. So they help these people get the financing because when they go to banks, they don't fit the bank's criteria. You know, they don't have the, uh, a, a, a big credit file. You know, they don't have a credit card. They don't have a, um, a bank loan. They don't have a car loan. Um, and also they don't have um, uh, the kind of the stringent credit criteria um, particulars that banks want, which is, you know, three years in existence and see your revenue go up. So microfinance institutions help to, to plug this, this financing gap. And, and, and Microly, we do our part. So um, we help uh, small financings from 1,000 ringgit to 50,000 ringgit. But the money doesn't come from a bank, but it comes from you or me, the crowd, basically. Thank you, Tunku Dani. That's a great sort of introduction. Catherine, I understand Butterfly FX does a lot of ad tech and financial literacy content to educate individuals uh, uh, regarding financial literacy. Catherine, can you share with us conceptually what does Butterfly FX do? Uh, share with us your story. Uh, what do you wish to accomplish? And what is the void in the industry that you're, willing to, you're attempting to fill? 
Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for the question and the kind introduction. And super excited to be here um, with with everyone on the, this panel today. Um, so I'm Catherine Lee. It's nice to meet everyone. I'm the co-founder of Butterfly Effects. As you can probably tell from my accent, I'm an American that met a Malaysian at Oxford and decided to start a social enterprise in Malaysia. And what we really did is we shared a common interest in empowering people to take control of their financial and everyday lives. And we really believe that the root of that empowerment is understanding. And this understanding and lack thereof really transcends socioeconomic barriers. I know we're talking about that today. Um, but what we find is some people can afford it and some can't, right? Especially those that are more um, vulnerable in our communities. And so that's really the systemic challenge that we're tackling um, at Butterfly Effects is how to better understand and instigate positive behavior change through digital education for the purpose of improving overall financial wellness, both now and in the future and hopefully uplift society as a result. Thank you very much, Catherine. So just very briefly, can you walk us through a practical story where there have been real social impact from the work that both of you do? Perhaps Catherine, you can start first. Uh, can you share with us a story of a practical project which uh, Butterfly Effects has undertaken or is currently undertaking uh, to impact a specific segment within the community? And, and what are some of the successes? What are some of the pain points? And, and what can we learn from that? Sure. Um, there's been quite a few, but I'm actually going to focus on two, and I'm going to hopefully keep this short and concise. Um, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about Microleap, of course. And then the other one I wanted to talk about is one of our earlier projects, um, which was in Haiti, actually, with a microfinance institution. And I'll talk about both of them because they're kind of on opposite sides of the spectrum, actually. People might think because people um, don't have access to banks that they're all kind of the same, but really it's quite diverse. Um, and so some of the things that we learned during that period is the difficulty, first of all, of adapting um, what is often a physical and in-person process, for example, financial education commonly done in person workshops and things like that. Um, especially if we look at the Grameen model, for example, for microfinance institutions. And so how do we adapt that for a digital platform? It becomes much more difficult to keep people engaged, um, to keep lessons bite-sized so that they can finish them, um, especially since micro entrepreneurs are very, very busy people. And then how do we actually get them exercises that are actionable so they can apply those learnings right away? Um, so that's been you know, pretty difficult challenge to figure out. Um, the other thing is, what are the key lessons that we want to tell, right? Financial education literacy is such a broad scheme of things, even for micro entrepreneurs, for example, with Microleap. And so it's kind of like the Goldilocks challenge is what is the right level of detail? What are the most important things? Because we're not trying to teach them everything. We're trying to teach them the things that matter most so that they can then go take that positive action. So it's not just learning for learning's sake, it's learning so that you can take action and improve your future. Um, and then a third kind of challenge um, that we kind of addressed was how do we assess learning outcomes, right? So with Microleap, we, we kind of use it a little bit as a carrot or requirement um, for, for, for the users there, um, but it differs per context, right? So it's really gonna depend on what outcomes you're looking for in real life and then tying the learning outcome to that success um, so that we make sure that people are educated on the right things and can you know, feel empowered moving forward. Some of the successes that we've seen, um, in particular in Haiti, they were actually using workbooks. Um, so physical workbooks, it's quite expensive, have to keep in warehouses. So actually found higher engagement than with the book because it's more interesting and more engaging. We use a lot of animations and videos. So hopefully that makes it a little bit more interesting for people to you know, sit through. Um, the second thing, you know, for example, Microleap and others is, is really encouraging people to exercise more critical thinking instead of just rote learning or memorization, which often financial education can become is just a memorization exercise. And you're never going to remember every single thing that you learn, right? So we need to make sure that they're actually exercising that and applying that right away. Some of the quick pain points that we found um, in Haiti in particular, actually found it didn't work for us at all because we we're trying to use a digital platform. Lack of stable data or Wi-Fi infrastructure was made it extremely difficult. We had these beautiful pictures of the teachers with, uh, with their phone um, and the video on the WhatsApp, but that's not really how it's meant to be experienced, right? And there are two kind of learners around them. So you can just imagine you know, what, how difficult that was in the field. Um, so we actually found that was really difficult and the offline online experience was not seamless at all. And then I think adjusting curriculums to fit the knowledge level. Of course, we always wanna adapt things as we learn more about that particular cohort. 
and make sure that um, they continue to learn and grow. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that. Uh, it's a very interesting point you make regarding the internet infrastructure. It's something which we'll come back to later in this discussion as well. So, Tunku Denny, how about for MicroLeap? Uh, just very briefly, any inspiring story you could share with us uh, where micro entrepreneurs have benefited from your services and, and, and there's a direct impact on their businesses and, and livelihoods? Uh, anything you'd like to share? Yeah. So, so uh, my favorite example is uh, we had a Pisang Goreng stall owner based out of uh, Johor Bahru. Um, she sells uh, Pisang Goreng direct from a stall. She needed about uh, 20,000 ringgit for her renovation. Um, it's a 30 year family business, you know, she's making revenue uh, and she only recently um, uh, kind of made her business formal by going to SSM about two years ago. Now she went to lots of banks and banks said you have not fulfilled the minimum three year requirement to, to get a loan. So every time she went, she had a, 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 the door slammed in the face and then she came to us. Uh, for Michaeli, she only needed to have at least six months in operation. So a very simple online uh, uh, application. Uh, she got her financing uh, within a one week uh, of being hosted on our platform. She got her 15,000 ringgit and she had to of course finish the Butterfly FX uh, online video tutorial before she get her financing. So one of, our, one of our requirements is that they have to finish um, the tutorial on basic debt management, uh, basic bookkeeping and what is P2P. Then they will get the financing from Michaeli. So it just shows that, you know, and uh, she got the money, she did her renovation and she's making, you know, uh, a lot of business out of it. So she saw increased sales. So just uh, goes to show that there are uh, micro enterprises that are willing to take the financing and pay back your financing um, that sometimes the banks don't see this and coming to alternative financing platforms such as ours is the way forward for many of these uh, micro enterprises. Thank you, Tungudani. That's a very, very inspiring story. But in a conversation like this, there's always two sides to the coin, right? So I'm going to play a devil's advocate here. And so as we continue to develop tools uh, for financial inclusion with the aim of addressing socioeconomic issues uh, like access to financing and poverty, I think it's absolutely pivotal that it's done in a meaningful way. And, and financial inclusion, uh, eradicating poverty, yes, these are amazing buzzwords in a way uh, with noble intentions to serve the underserved. But here are some not so encouraging sort of historical stats on microfinancing, right? So in South Africa, for instance, 94% of finance raised through microfinancing end up being used by business owners just to put food on the table rather than being invested into their businesses. Uh, and as such, many businesses fail, uh, the debt spirals out of control, and people can't actually break out of the poverty cycle. And another example is a government study in India found that 2.5K farmers committed suicide in 2015, and all of them uh, having struggled with debt. And so critiques of microfinance uh, suggest that it simply does not deal with the root cause, but in fact makes it worse. And, and some hold the view that instead of empowering, it impoverishes. So Tunkudeni, what are your thoughts on this point? Uh, can microfinance really leave a, a sustainable impact on big socioeconomic issues uh, such as poverty? Or, or as some suggest, could it result in struggling entrepreneurs uh, being caught in a dangerous cycle of debt? Over to you. Well, uh, debt is always a double-edged sword, okay? Um, debt can be good, uh, but debt can be bad as well. So uh, that is one of the reasons that the Securities Commission, which is our regulator, said that for P2P financing, uh, we are only allowed to finance businesses. So minimum is sole prop or enterprise because then you are making what is considered um, good debt or debt that is used to make more, more money rather than personal financing, which is prohibited under SC rules where you want to borrow uh, funds to maybe buy the latest iPad or the latest Apple Mac, you know? So for us, we look and make sure that the financing, the microfinancing that we provide is used for, for a specific reason, for business expansion, for working capital, anything will take them uh, to leap from where they are now to the next level. Um, so we have to make sure one, that they are making uh, revenue and profit so that they can afford this financing. If they cannot afford the financing, when we look at, when we really do our credit risk checking and they cannot afford it, we have to say no, because we have to be responsible lenders uh, on our platform. So we have to make sure that uh, all these micro enterprises can afford the financing, uh, you know, they won't go get into trouble the next two years. 
So we really, really check into the, the, the business, the PL statements, the bank, uh, the bank statements. You know, we even speak to them uh, to find out what their future plans are. So once they tick all the right bo boxes, then only we will provide the financing. The last thing we want to be is a couple of alongs, you know, giving up financing just for, for the fun of it uh, and uh, giving, you know, really high 30%. Um, per annum uh, interest rates or something like that. So responsible lending to microfinance um, uh, sector is key. And that is how we will help, you know, um, uh, all these B40 owned businesses go to the next level. Lovely. Thank you so much to Kudani. Catherine, would you like to add anything to this conversation? I think education and literacy certainly play a pivotal role in enabling this. In, 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 in a way, there are multiple factors to this, right? Yes, we can have great regulations and yes, we can have good and responsible financing platforms. But if entrepreneurs do not understand the application or the risks associated with financial services, we're back to square one. So, so what is the role of education uh, in this aspect? Yeah, it was, uh, we talked earlier about empowerment and understanding, right? And I think this is a collective responsibility, not just on the regulator side, but also, you know, private actors and companies. Um, and that's why we think we would like to see uh, more of the, especially fintechs in this space that are entering and trying to go really rapidly also place the similar emphasis on the education of their consumers, because, you know, they'll also get more out of it on both sides. Um, I think what we're dealing with also is we, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the fintech transition, although I know you're mentioning some, some more like, uh, you know, in-person type of interactions here, is that when we see, you know, microfinance institutions um, that function well, perhaps, or responsibly, um, they're very much um, functioning on a basis of collective responsibility and reciprocity. Um, those things are very, very important, not only for the institution itself, but also for, um, for, the, for the consumers or, or the people that are taking out the loans, right? Um, and this also manage, manages the, the risk level better, right? Um, so we actually see kind of lower default rates, for example, um, especially among women, but also when we have these cohorts where people are treating each other as you know, um, shares of this of this loan essentially, and applying pressure to each other to make sure that they repay on a regular basis, and so that community based model or collective responsibility or trust is kind of lost sometimes when you move to a more fintech model sometimes, um, because what's happening is now you're on your own, and so you have this individual responsibility you have to self manage, and that is extremely difficult. That paired with lack of information or lack of right type of information can result in people being irresponsible, right? And because now it's an individual responsibility, you also need to pair that education component so that person can make decisions for themselves, right? And that's extremely difficult if people are just thinking about today or tomorrow or next week, and they're not taking six months down the road into account. Um, this is when, you know, some potentially, you know, unproductive uses of loans can take place. Um, so yeah, I would say it's, you know, it's, it's about, um, you know, providing more of that given, given that shift of responsibility. Um, and then also, you know, how do we make sure that, uh, in general, the goal isn't perpetual debt, even though that can be profitable, right? So that's coming more from the institutional side, because we know it is, right? And so there's shifts on both ends to make sure that the consumer is not caught in the middle all of a sudden in a, in a not so great position. Lovely. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I think there's a sweet spot somewhere in the middle, right? So the purpose of alternative financing is to be more inclusive and to sort of reduce the barriers to entry, especially for the underserved. And on the other hand, the last thing we want, as you folks mentioned in doing so, is to encourage micro entrepreneurs to undertake sort of subprime commitments uh, when they actually cannot afford it. So, and at the same time, to actually make a difference in the lives of micro entrepreneurs, we need kind of alternative ways of doing due diligence and credit evaluation, as, as Nukudani, you mentioned, which is different than the traditional financial services. Uh, so I just like to ask this question, what does that sweet spot look like? Because you're towing both lines, right? You're, you want to be more inclusive, but at the same time, you don't want to be uh, sort of uh, too, you don't want to just take out all the barriers as well, right? So, so how does that that where, where does that balance lie? Tungu Danny, you, you want to comment on that? Yeah, so we have a proprietary credit risk algorithm, which we use both traditional and alternative uh, credit risk scoring methods. So uh, because all our borrowers or issuers have to be uh, a business, minimum uh, social, uh, sole prop or enterprise, um, we do have 
data from, we use Experian, which is a credit bureau. Um, so that's part of it. Uh, but we also use psychometric testing. So we use a, a third party vendor called Global SciTech and um, they have built a psychometric test, which measures the willingness and the ability for these micro enterprises to repay their loan or repay their financing. So we put that all into our credit risk algorithm. It sprouts out a, um, a risk rating between low, medium to high risk. And from that, we can have an educated um, feel of do we, are we good to lend to this kind of um, enterprise or not? Um, so we also look at the debt service ratio, make sure they can afford the financing. That's key in, in our credit risk algorithm. So that all goes into this, um, into this engine. And then we will take a call whether to yes, we want to host them on our platform or no, unfortunately we, we have to say no. So we have to have a balance because in the P2P world, you are uh, taking care of two sets of users, right? The lenders or the investors and the borrowers, which are the issuers. So we have to take care of both. Lovely, thank you to good any. Catherine, you have anything to comment on this? I'm going to comment less on the model, which I think Danny has taken a very good uh, job of. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about perhaps the, the measurement or metrics that we were, we were kind of trying to talk about. And what I mentioned earlier with the intent of um, why we're doing the loans, right, or why we're providing those and what we want to actually achieve. And so I think, um, you know, traditionally, it's, it's, we're very profit driven, right, in finance. I mean, it's all about the numbers. And so... Um, I'm always curious how else we can measure success, right? Um, surely we don't want to give out so much that we're getting really high default rates, right? Um, but we also don't want to restrict those people that just don't have the records that are sufficient, right, that, that a bank would reject. And so I think, you know, from the, the, the provider of the loans perspective, you know, what does success mean? It's not just about making profit. Often there are other secondary goals that we want to evaluate, right? Um, if we do things like education, and other things as well, it can be much broader than just, you know, that because really finance is a, is a means for achieving your life goals, right? And for having freedom to do the things that you want to do. And so I think about it a little bit more broadly than that as to what we can achieve. Um, and then again, I'm going to fall back on the education front. So I think, you know, it's really important to address, you know, even, even if we are opening up to more, there are just so many people that are still left out because they just fundamentally distrust or do not understand the financial ecosystem and because of short-term thinking, right? So I think, you know, we probably need to address that in conjunction, of course, being responsible with the algorithms that we leverage. And certainly there are a lot of platforms out there that use a lot of social data. Um, and I think, Whenever you know we hear about data, particularly in the U.S., for example, we want to be really careful with the usage and monetization of that data because it's extremely sensitive, um, and and then to leverage it in the most responsible way possible. So, um, perhaps that's not an exact answer to what you're saying, but hopefully it adds something to the conversation. All right, lovely. Thank you, Catherine. I was just looking through some of the Slido questions, and some of them align with what I in initially intended to sort of uh, ask initially, anyway. So. Here's one question. Rural areas have less access to the internet. This is on your point as well, Catherine. How do we reach and help rural businesses? So obviously, since fintech services are primarily run at the internet, so a tool like microfinancing um, can at times target entrepreneurs from rural areas which don't have good internet infrastructure. So in a way, does the use of technology, this question I think is tackling this point, this, is there really a digital divide? And it, does the use of technology cause more disparity uh, instead of inclusion? Uh, Catherine, you did you did mention something from Haiti from a global perspective. Tungku Danny, uh, what what do you think is the situation in Malaysia? Well, Malaysia is very different in terms of internet penetration. According to uh, the Malaysia Commission Multimedia Commission, uh, internet penetration in Malaysia is seventy eight percent, which is high. Smartphone penetration, I think, is in, in the region of eighty percent. So we are on the same level as the developed countries, uh, same level as Hong Kong and Singapore. And you compare against uh, Indonesia, for example, internet penetration is only about 15, maybe 20%. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are much higher in terms of internet penetration compared to other countries in, in, in Asia. So we are well-placed for digital financial services. Uh, and that study was done in 2018. So by, by now, 2021, I'm sure it has definitely risen. So I think Malaysia understands that there is a, a need for digital uh, digitalization uh, and need to go online. 
We knew that when, uh, and this is pushed forward even more so when um, COVID-19 hit and people were forced to stay indoors, not go out. And the only means of actually buying things was using your laptop or smartphone. Mm -hmm. So I think Malaysian MSMEs are quick to adapt. Um, people are using online platforms to sell their products. So I think slowly but surely the people in the rural areas as internet uh, penetration increases, they will soon jump on the, the digital financial services bandwagon and, and get online. Yeah, relating to that, there's another question on a, on a similar tone on Slido. Many small merchants are not digital literates and how can fintech sort of reach out to them so in a way the way i read this question there are multiple factors here right so before we even talk about financial literacy in the context of of fintech services uh, and obviously we need to have good internet infrastructure which both of you have have pointed out uh, but we also need widespread digital literacy so what do you folks think is the state of digital literacy before uh, we even talk about using ad tech content to sort of penetrate the intended audience so catherine maybe you want to touch on that do you think yeah. that's the issue? I, I'm not going to remark too much on the uh, level of digital literacy because I don't have the stat in front of me. But what I can say is this. I think regardless of the tech platform or the whatever form it takes, I think the biggest issue is trust. Honestly, there are just very fundamental things that, um, you know, even in the U.S. and other places, like we do have the same, you know, level of penetration, but people aren't leveraging these services and why it's it's behavioral, right? It's it's not something they're used to. It's not something they're familiar with. It's something that they're scared of, right? So I think when we think about, I mean, going back to the rural answer, for example, and even other places, even urban areas, um, I think we need to develop trust first. And this is why microfinance institutions do all these things in person and develop those connections and we had spoken with some providers that establish hubs essentially, and those people are responsible for going around and evangelizing and creating groups, right? And so even though that for us might seem like, well, why do you have to do that? Um, this, is, this is a big part of our lives, right? Finance runs our lives, money runs our lives. And so I think for such an important decision, although we may have the mechanism for delivering that, whether it's a FinTech app or, or something like that, or you know, um, you know, even online delivery, Finance stands on its own. So I think, you know, it requires kind of a combination of the physical and the digital world combining. And maybe the physical world is more of the, the education and, and initial awareness kind of uh, campaigns. And, and perhaps then we can transition them to a more digital experience and have it be hybrid. But I don't really see many cases in which it would be entirely successful just digitally for those people that are perhaps reluctant or would otherwise not engage. Okay, lovely. Thank you so much, Catherine. I think we have time for one last question before we have to say goodbye. So this is, a, I'll try to sort of um, combine a couple of questions. What if things really go wrong? And obviously, we have been going through a tough time through COVID. We've seen now how hard COVID has hit a lot of our businesses. Uh, can these businesses repay their loans? And what are the protection measures in place? So in a way, how has COVID sort of impacted um, the microfinancing industry? Just a really quick brief one before we say goodbye. To good any, you want to start first? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely impacted in terms of the ability to repay the loans, for sure. We are seeing uh, loans um, getting very, uh, being paid uh, slow, slower. Um, they ask us, you know, maybe I can pay half this, this month and, and half, the, um, you know, next month. So we, it does impact it. You know, it, that's what happens when the economy tanks, when it, it goes down, right? People are... Uh, are forced not to go out to shops to buy. People are forced not to go and, you know, interact and transact and, and purchase things. So it is going to hit the, the micro enterprises more. So that's why we, uh, as a microfinance institution, as a, as, as a P2P um, player focused on microfinance, we have to just be careful on who we onboard on hosts on our platform. The ones that we're keen to, to host on our platform and, and ask for financing are the ones that have pivoted online. So those sell on Facebook, on, on WhatsApp, uh, maybe sell on Grab and uh, Food Panda, but of course they take a big chunk of the, the, <laughs> the restaurant's revenue, which I'm not very keen about, um, but that's not another story. Um, but yes, yeah, so those that pivot online are the ones that we're really keen to host on our platform right now. Thank you to good. Any Catherine, any final words before we have to say goodbye? Nope, I think you covered it all. <laughs> all right, lovely. Uh, 
So Catherine and Tunggu Danny, that's how we have time for today. And it's been an absolute pleasure to have this conversation with both of you. So thank you very much for your contribution to this session. And I wish you all the best. And we hope that the microfinancing industry continues to flourish in a meaningful way. So to all our audience watching, thank you for listening in. Do stay tuned for the final session of uh, day two of SC by SC. Uh, Matthew Griffin will be presenting on the subject, Disruptor or Enabler, the Future of Collaboration Between Fintechs and Financial Institutions. And that starts at 3.15 p.m., uh, which is just 15 minutes from now. And it's a session you do not want to miss. So it's going to be amazing. See you there. Uh, for now, goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.